Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for attending class today. Today is November the 5th, 2020. And today we're going to uh, discuss general entrepreneurship. Um, what we're going to do today um, is continue on my discussion from our first class two weeks ago um, and describing uh, what entrepreneurship is um, and um, a little bit about myself. Um, today, we're going to talk more about general entrepreneurship, what exactly is entrepreneurship. You'll see a couple of videos. I have a couple of videos embedded here from another uh, college professor and from an entrepreneur that you all are familiar with, um, as they will both talk to you about different facets of entrepreneurship. We will probably, this will probably be an hour and a half course, so we should be done around 5.30 or so. And if anyone have any questions at any time, please feel free to write a message in the chat box. I do have um, the chat feature available. I am reading it in front of me. Um, and so uh, please, uh, please let's make this an interactive uh, space. I also wanna thank you all um, for your patience uh, last week because um, we did not have class but we had, uh, um, I was uh, chair of a, a tech, a state business conference. And so did any one of you uh, participate in any of the workshops from the conference that I sent you all? Please let me know in the chat box. Okay, if not, we'll keep going. Today on our agenda, um, we will first talk a little bit of, a little on housekeeping. Um, then we'll have a lecture. Then I want us to do a group activity. I want us to split up where I'll create breaking, uh, breakout rooms uh, for you all to do an activity. Um, and then we'll, we'll come back uh, together, all right? All right, some housekeeping. Canvas. So a lot of you, I wanted to, um, I graded uh, most of our most of your papers from the last couple of weeks. I want to say a couple of things. One, um, even though you submit things late, uh, if you've accidentally submitted a late work um, space, I initially gave you two weeks to where I won't um, subject you to a late penalty. I think I'm going to make that last throughout the semester. So if you can, please uh, turn in. I know there's a lot of a lot of assignments, um, but because the, you all have five weeks left in this course, um, I'm not going to deduct, to deduct um, late work um, because it's a minute late. I will deduct points based on the content of your assignment, um, but it won't be because of late work. Even if it has the designation of a late submission, um, I will still give you full credit, all right? Also, CRED assignments. A couple of you all completed the first survey. Um, if you would, thank you all very much for that. Um, are you all, are you all, um, when you finish your survey, are you all submitting them and saying, I have completed the survey? Please let me know if you all are doing it. Has anyone from this class complete the uh, CRED survey number one? I completed it for a different class. Okay. Well, you could definitely complete it for this class also because that'll get you extra credit. Um, if you complete the CRED um, assignment, see if you could do it twice um, and then um, submit it in Canvas. Uh, I would prefer you to submit a snapshot of proof that you completed the survey. Normally there's a final page um, that states you have completed, thank you for completing the survey. Attach that to your Canvas assignment and that's how I'll give you, I wanna say five extra points, five extra credit points there. But if not, right, I'm good. if not just type in, I have completed CRED assignment and what I'll do is I will double check that with um, the office who is administering these surveys and making sure that you actually have done that before giving you credit. All right. So, are there any questions about that? 
Yeah, I want to get that uh, straight right quick. So you're saying if we've already done it, uh, go back and do it again and then screenshot the last page? Or are you saying if we've already done it, we're good? If you've already done it for this class and you've submitted it, submitted it to me via Canvas, you're good. Some people are saying that they have multiple classes that they qualify for the CREG survey. So if you are, if you've done it in another class, maybe earlier this semester or in the summer or last or in the fall or in the spring rather, uh, please take that survey again. And in order to get extra credit, um, you will have to submit that again uh, for this class. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Good deal. No problem. No problem. Thank you for that question, Kavion. Is it Kavion? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, good. Deal. All right. Extra credit opportunities. Um, I will be submitting some. Oh, second thing. Email me questions if you have. Um, I have. I appreciate you all who have been submitting questions these last couple of weeks. I was a little behind, um, but now I am I caught up. Um, so please continue to um, email me or message me via Canvas if you have any questions. Extra credit um, Yes. Do you prefer an email direct to you or a message on Canvas? Is that good enough? Because I honestly, I prefer. I prefer on yeah, I prefer a message. I know you haven't, Sonia. I, I prefer a message on Canvas. I just said earlier I was I'm running behind, but I'm playing catch up right now. Okay. All right. Okay. So, You're fine. No problem. I will I should get back to everyone's messages by the end of this week. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions on communications to me? Good deal. For extra credit opportunities, I will be posting announcements of events that's happening on campus or with or in the community. Some of y'all saw that I there was a state conference last week that you could have participated in extra credit. Um, if you all did participate in that, please um, write me based on the workshop that you were a part of. Um, write me what workshop you attended and submit that via one of the extra credit slots so you can get extra credit from there. You can get a maximum of 10 points total. Um, I believe I have 10, um, I will create 10 um, assignment slots for you to submit extra credit assignments there. So if I haven't done that for this class yet, I will definitely have it completed by the end of this evening so that you can submit your extra credit opportunities there, all right? Also, I have not assigned your group assignments yet. Um, I will do that today. Um, I meant to do that last week, but I was too inundated with the conference. So I'll do that today because we're also, the last portion of this class, will be discussing your midterm and your final exam. So once we have our group discussion, we have, we'll have our group activity today, you will have a better understanding of what I expect for you from your midterm um, and for your final exam. Uh, or one portion of your final exam, so that you all can, once you get assigned your groups, can meet with your groups, all right? Before we get started, could someone give me an, a definition of what entrepreneurship is in their minds? You can either type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and let me know what your opinion of what entrepreneurship is. Um, I think I might be a little off, but I would like to give my uh, definition of entrepreneurship. Okay, please do, Andrew. Um, so I believe that entrepreneurship, according to the textbook, I now understand that it's a mindset, not so much... Um, you know, like a talent that people are born with. It's definitely something that we can be taught. Mm -hmm. But I would like to add also from the textbook that it's also a series of actually implementing your new ideas and seeing them out, not just having these ideas and jumping right in, but also it's just uh, like a balancing game of really incorporating a plan and then seeing it through. It's really good. That's that's a great assessment. You're not that far off. 
So that's actually all, all things that you said encompasses what entrepreneurship is. Um, it is a mindset. It's not, people think that it's a specific profession, um, but there are entrepreneurs in every industry. So you're absolutely right about that. Um, and it is a place where it's a, it's a, it's a realm um, that is a, a, an economic engine, right? And so all of those things that you said was good. So good job. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Anyone else have a, a, wants to build on what Angie said? So just based from the assignments we've had, um, what I've gathered uh, of an entrepreneur is that uh, it's someone who seeks out opportunities, but opportunities, opportunities in the sense of um, an issue or a problem people face or have. And mm -hmm. Uh, the entrepreneur will uh, come up with a plan or a, a product or a service to help uh, supply that need. Exactly. Or that opportunity. Exactly. An entrepreneur um, is truly a problem solver. So what an entrepreneur does is it he or she finds, uh, identifies a problem, identifies a pain point somewhere. Let's just say someone is, Someone makes coats and you make jackets all the time, but the jackets don't have hoods, right? And so an entrepreneur, and it's uh, a place that rains a lot. So an entrepreneur can say, huh, everyone have all these jackets without hoods on them and people are getting wet. I can create something, whether it's an umbrella or an extension for the jacket that can satisfy the need that people are need that our people are having covering their heads making sure they're dry and i can create a business model to charge them money or charge them to, to get some value from them so that i can scale and repeat a business so entrepreneurs are problem solvers they create the solution and they create a a, um, a financial model so that they can thrive in so that those that's a great example. Um, I want to say that was KB9. Does anyone else would anyone else like to add on to those two definitions before we go to the next slide? Anyone at all? If not, okay. Let's go here. I have something, I have a slide from Mark Cuban. Let's see if this will work. Here we go. I'm going to see quick it? and dirty rules that every entrepreneur needs to be aware of. Number one, sales cures all. There's never been a company in the history of companies no. that's ever succeeded without sales. Anybody who's ever told you, don't worry about sales, you can grow it and then worry about sales later, they're lying to you. They will fail, you will fail. You have to be able to sell. And do you know who the biggest salesperson in your company has to be? You. And number two, selling is not convincing. Selling is helping. A lot of people, particularly if you don't have a sales background or Sorry. this is your first time. In can y'all see it now? Yes. Okay, well, we'll start. I'm going to give you some quick and dirty rules that every entrepreneur needs to be aware of. Number one, sales cures all. There's never been a company in the history of companies that's ever succeeded without sales. Anybody who's ever told you, don't worry about sales, you can grow it and then worry about sales later. They're lying to you. They will fail. You will fail. You have to be able to sell. And do you know who the biggest salesperson in your company has to be? You. And number two, selling is not convincing. Selling is helping. A lot of people, particularly if you don't have a sales background or this is your first time in sales, think it's like, oh, I'm selling ice to Eskimos, right? I'm doing something where I have to convince somebody to buy something they otherwise wouldn't buy. Wrong. That has nothing to do with anything. When you're selling, you're helping. The, being, the whole concept of being a great salesperson is not about who can talk the fastest, even though I am talking kind of fast. It's not about who can talk the most nonsense. It's about taking the time to understand the needs of the person you're selling to. Because if you can't create a benefit for them, if you can't show them why your product is going to be better for them and their life than the other options out there or what they were doing before, 
you are not going to have a company. The third message is all entrepreneurs lie to themselves. We all go through the same process. We tell ourselves, this is the best. Everybody loves us. Everybody, you know, no one's going to not like my product. Of course, it's not true. What I like to tell people is when you have a company, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to figure out how to kick your own ass before someone else does it for you. You have to look at your own company and be brutally honest with yourself and say, what do we do well? That's great. But also be honest and say, what do we not do well? Where are our challenges? And then how can we improve? Uh, what was the second rule again? Um, uh, sales is about helping. What's the second rule? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. So what were y'all thoughts on that uh, slide, on that video presentation? Was Mark Cuban accurate? Um, did... Is that what you all think when you all hear the word or it's entrepreneurship? What are your thoughts? It kind of, it changed uh, the point of view that you have about entrepreneurs. It's like, How so? So like whenever he said that, uh, um, like entrepreneurs lie to themselves, they can mm -hmm. like, one, if I start something, I will say like, I'm the best. I'm, I will try to convince them I'm the best, but I have to think about that. Like if I'm truly doing well, like better than others, and I have to make sure like whatever I say match my actions or what I'm doing. That's the way I see it. That makes sense. Yeah. And so when terms of, especially, I want to go back to the, the, the Mark Cuban when he says entrepreneurs must lie to themselves. Um, that really means that you can't really have limits. You can't really limit yourself to anything, right? So entrepreneurs, uh, people, smart people, people who had jobs, people who worked in places um, and know the, the importance of a specific workload um, may have a set expectations of something. But as an entrepreneur, um, you almost have to um, kind of tell yourself, to, to push yourself to go above and beyond. And so that's kind of what he's really saying. You really have to be a self-motivator, self-starter um, on that. And so you were, Ramsey, you are definitely aligned with what, what he was saying. Um, so I appreciate your contribution um, to the discussion because you're absolutely right. Um, it's all about perspective and how you, how you switch it and how you perceive it. What else, what else uh, did you all catch from that brief two or three minute video clip? Anyone else? I think he was uh, fairly accurate. Uh, I think for me, like growing up, when I thought about like uh, even the idea of selling, uh, I look at like uh, a salesman at a car dealership or something like that and how they're always trying to hassle the customer into buying something that they probably don't necessarily need. And I mean, I guess like, uh, some entrepreneurs may do that as well, not necessarily thinking about like, uh, I mean, I know that's really supposed to be the goal, but you know, maybe you can get so caught up in, like you said yourself, thinking that everybody loves your product and you know, you just want to like get the sales out there to the point where you're not really necessarily thinking about help, helping the customer. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. that necessarily makes sense, but. It does, it does. You have to find the balance. So Mark Cuban says you have to be able to sell yourself. You can't rely on other people to sell your own product, but you don't want to sell so much to where you're pissing people off, right? Or you are being cheesy or you're overextending yourself to the point where you're actually lying to the customer um, on something. You have to sell to help. Right. What was that? You have to sell to help. Exactly. That's why that second point was crucial. Like you sell in order to benefit your customer. 
don't sell like and, and keep, uh, car, use car salesman as a great example. Their intention isn't their number one priority isn't to please the customer. Their number one priority is to sell cars off of the lot. And so if that is your mindset, um, when you're selling something to someone, um, you could be a bit over anxious and people can sense, wow, this dude, this person, this woman really just wants to, you know, they don't really care about me. They just want to get me in a car and spend for me to spend money. Um, so you have to be careful um, when you do that and understand that there's a balance. Good deal. So let me give you all a my definition of what entrepreneurship is. And for me, I think entrepreneurship is the activity of setting up a business or businesses, one, taking on financial risk, two, in hopes of a profit. Let me repeat that. Entrepreneurship to me is the activity of setting up a business. So you have to formally set up a business um, you have to take on financial risk, meaning you either use your money or you use investors' money to create a business in hopes that you make money from it. It's not guaranteed. If you set up the business, you put money in, it's not guaranteed that you'll get your money back. But you, you should hope to get a profit, right? And so those three things are really important because one, when you set up a business, that shows that you're serious. You're probably already serious. All, everyone's serious with their talents. But whenever you formalize a DBA or an LLC, things of that nature, you open your shingle, if you will. That is a crucial step in, in stating how um, important, how viable your business is. Investing in your own business, having skin in the game is the second aspect of it. You need to put your money where your mouth is. Um, some people um, want to have a business. They want to be a boss, but they don't want to put any type of financial risk in there, whether it's their own money or whether it's asking people for money in hopes of a profit. This quote is, the entrepreneur always searches for change, responds to it, and exploits it as an opportunity. This is from an economist in the 19th century, Drucker. Um, and his, his position is, entrepreneurs see things that already exist, identifies them, and tries to figure out how to make it better. Once they make some process better, the exploitation of it, is creating their own business, right, as an opportunity. A good example of that is Steve Jobs with Apple. He's an entrepreneur because he searched for change. He wanted to change the computer industry. His focus, his philosophy in the late 70s, early 80s, was that the computer mainframe was not built for graphic artists. It was not built for the creators. So he wanted to create a computer that wasn't for business, he wanted to create a computer that was innovative so that people can draw in real life um, on, on a digital computer space. So he saw what he wanted to do. He responded to it. He created the Apple computer. And then he used that as an opportunity. He built a business and he created a culture where uh, Apple, see my iPhone, see this broken MacBook Pro that I have now, that is uh, a culture that he's created for a financial opportunity for he and his company. So that, in my opinion, that's, that's the definition of entrepreneurship. That's what I did, if you remember, two weeks ago um, when I was in SMU, a student at SMU, and I was trying to find a way to help, kid, to help kids, tutor kids in math and science. I created a business, um, it started working, and we were fortunate to sell it in 2012. So that's what entrepreneurs do. And thank you for your addition. I see your, your comment, um, Angie. Thank you for adding, adding that in the conversation. All right. Now, this next video is going to talk to you about 
two different types of entrepreneurs. The first one is an SME, which is which stands for a small medium enterprise. And the other one is IDE, which is innovative or innovation driven enterprises. So pay attention to this professor from MIT. He's going to talk to you about the differences between an SME and an IDE. All right. Let's see if I can get this to work a little bit better. Hi, my name is Joel Lett. I'm the switch screen on here. Can y'all see this? Okay, great. Thanks, man. Hi, my name is Joel Lett. I'm going to talk about discipline on entrepreneurship. 24 steps to successfully launch a new venture. What uh, I'm going to start with is what is entrepreneurship? Because this term is used all the time. It's bandied about everyone for entrepreneurship. However, there's two fundamentally different types of entrepreneurship that I'm going to talk about. Um, first of all, we, we have entrepreneurship. We have what we call SME entrepreneurship. SME stands for small, medium enterprise entrepreneurship. These are fundamentally small companies that will stay small. They may have been around for a while. They're focused on local markets. They're often service, service businesses that are servicing a local opportunity that's looking to go global. They know, they know there's a need local. They want to address it. This could be a dry cleaner. This could be a nail salon. This could be a restaurant. Or, or a pizza parlor to reference to the paper that's still in very Um These are fundamentally important companies to an economy and a region because they serve a need. But relative to the, the, the way they're made up is the system that they create is one that shows kind of linear growth. And then at some point, it, it, it usually taps out of the market. Now, this is a, an approximation of what goes on. But that's what it looks like, linear growth. Like. Linear growth like. But you notice that, that, that this is cash flow here from the business, that there's not a tremendous amount of cash flow out. Again, simplification. However, when we go to IDE over here, which I will call innovation driven entrepreneurship um, or innovation driven enterprise entrepreneurship, we have a fundamentally different business. Um, this one is looking for global market or super regional market. And the, while, while this one is usually owner, the, the owner is usually you know, maintaining control of it. This one is going to require more cash because the dynamics of this business look, it loses money and then it's going to start showing exponential growth. So there's this negative cash flow here. This is cash flow on the y axis, and this is time along the x axis. It'll initially have to require some capital to be put into it, but then if it works, it will take off because it's got basically unlimited funds. Underlying what they're doing here is an innovation unique that allows them to address much broader markets. So they're not just focused on the local market, but much broader market. Mm -hmm. This is very important because this is going to require more cash at that. So while this is owned by the, you know, this is controlled by the family or the owners, this over here is going to have shareholders and a bunch of other people. This is very important difference here because while this business is, is a very important business, the underlying demographics for the underlying system and training for this does not look the same as this. It's almost like you have two sports, basketball and baseball. You know, sure you run in both, you jump in both, but Want, and that's true of these, but Michael Jordan was a great basketball player. He turned out not to be a great baseball player. All his training was for that. So, likewise, there could be some crossover here. But generally, there's more risk in these. The people that are trained for these are doing, you know, how to manage make multiple stakeholders, how to do an underlying organization. The next section, we're going to look at 
what is the patient and to find that precisely. But the point of this is two types of entrepreneurship, small medium enter enterprise entrepreneurship, small companies distributed geographically, and then innovation driven enterprise entrepreneurship, companies that might not make it, but then if they make it, they get to grow and be very, very big. These end up, um, you don't need a lot of these to generate a lot of jobs. These you need a lot. These tend to be more clustered. These tend to not be so clustered. All right. So we just heard about what SMEs are and IDEs. Let's talk a little bit about SMEs. I wrote in the chat box, what's an example of um, an SME? And someone wrote local beauty or barbershops. That's a great example because one, it's a service industry. Um, two, they are businesses that typically are, um, they're not as scalable as let's just say an insurance agency or like Aflac or things of that nature. It ne you never really see a barber shop or beauty shop that has franchises across the country. At the most, you may see four, three or four shops, right? But um, quite honestly, SMEs are really mom and pop stores. Uh, someone asked the question, uh, would Fiesta be considered an SME? Actually, no. Um, Fiesta is considered an IDE mainly because it is a large, it's a franchise. Now it has a home feel uh, for as a mom and pop shop, but its actual business structure, um, yes, you're right. Um, they were Walmarts or IDs as well because their, their, their structure, their corporate structure involves or requires investors from, uh, from all over the world. Um, so they're more IDE and Quite honestly, they're all over the country. Um, they, they're they're named different places, different names in different places, but um, it's all under one large grocery store on the Fiesta. Um, an SME, another another example of an SME uh, could be a restaurant, a small restaurant. So my wife's family owns a Jamaican restaurant called the Island Spot on Jefferson Boulevard. I actually just left there. I had a food tasting. That's an SME because they only have two, they're about to start three stores. Um, and the financial model, the business model, um, isn't as robust as a Chili's or a Papa Do's or some or a restaurant that has multiple locations all over the country. And so SMEs and IDEs are a little different. We can talk, we can. I normally go a little bit more specific into that, but I just wanted you to understand that there are different types of, of business models. And you will need to know that when identifying what business you would like to create. Um, if you're an SME, you're a small, medium enterprise, um, that comes with pros and cons. A pro of this is that you don't need a lot of capital relatively speaking, to, to get started. So let's say I want to own a, um, I want to make cups, I want to make mugs, right? Well, I can have, I can save money so I can create the materials to buy, the machines to buy uh, so I can create mugs. And then I can sell them out of my car. I can sell them on Etsy, Etsy rather, I can sell them on Amazon. And that is a different, um, that is a mom and pop virtual business compared to um, Hallmark or compared to the Disney store, which sells a lot of things. They actually have multiple locations all over the country and the financing in order to make it work is totally different. Um, in fact, being um, being a part of an IDE usually means you're not a sole owner of it. You're typically a part of a corporate structure, which is very different than a 
uh, mom and pop shop, which you may be owners of. Does everyone understand that? Can everyone, uh, does anyone have any questions about that? So how many locations does the business have to have in order to be considered an IDE? It's not necessary. There's not an absolute number. So I don't, I shouldn't, you shouldn't say if once you have more than four locations, you're now moving from an ID from an SME to an IDE. What happens typically when you increase your capacity, when you move from one store to two stores or from two stores to five stores, you tend to change your business model because having to raise money to build three stores simultaneously typically uh, requires you to borrow money from either a bank or borrow money from investors. And when you ask for invest investment money, you typically ask that for in millions of dollars at a time. And so when you do that, the plan is, okay, I'm going to get in debt for about three years before I will make a profit. That's kind of what differentiates IDE from SMEs. Um, you can make more money, but you will, I don't know if you saw that graph where there was a little dip before it increased exponentially and he drew lines on the diagram. Well, that, that area uh, in the financial model is typically called the valley of death. That happens when you borrow money. So you have a lot of money, but you're not making any profit because you're using that money to build your restaurants. It typically takes a year or so to build a restaurant. And the time that you're building, you're not making any profit. In fact, you're losing money. But once you built your location and you start getting customers, and if you get customers from 10 locations at one time, you make 10 times the money instead of having just one store. And so that's why the graph shoots up exponentially. So you deal with the risk a higher risk when you deal with IDE enterprises, but you can have a better reward as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. Do anyone have any other questions about IDEs and SMEs? No. Good deal. We'll keep going. I do want us to, start to talk a little bit about uh, the differences between an entrepreneur and the differences between the small business owner. They're both very as closely associated, closely related to each other, and they're both very important. Um, normally, people like to say entrepreneurs are better than small business owners or vice versa, but quite honestly, you need both entrepreneurs and both small business and a small business owner in the same economic ecosystem. In fact, Entrepreneurs typically transition into a small business owner, and I'm going to tell you how now. So, so entrepreneurs, so entrepreneur, I consider them a chef. When you're a chef, you're kind of an artist, you're a creator. You are inventing a cuisine uh, from scratch. A chef, let's just say if you're a chef of a Jamaican restaurant, dial in spot, um, you want to create something that's unique um, that people will, will like, right? Well, I'm going to cross over to a business owner. Once that chef perfected that meal, that particular thing, and it's placed on the menu, it's on the menu, and now people would love to order it. Well, instead of the chef creating something individually every single time, which may take an hour, it could take 30 minutes to an hour. He creates a system or she creates a system to where cooks can replicate that same meal for a fraction of the time. So a chef spends a lot of energy, a lot of time, makes a lot of mistakes in perfecting this one meal so that it could taste amazing. And what happens is once that meal is perfected and it's placed on the menu, he teaches several cooks how to cook. When the cooks learn how to cook this meal, 
instead of them going through all of the mistakes and all of the process of making this great dish, they should go straight to the result and they could probably cook it in five to 10 minutes. Well, an entrepreneur spends a lot of energy, a lot of time creating the business, creating a way to, to differentiate them their business with everyone else. And once they've perfected that, once Steve Jobs created the perfect computer, he created a company called Apple, and then he created an assembly line that was able to repeat and scale a lot of computers at one time so that people can buy it. Those people that works on the assembly line are the cooks or they're the small business owners. And so small business owners typically benefit from whatever a chef or an entrepreneur creates. A great example of this is um, an insurance company, right? An insurance company um, uh, or a franchisee someone who owns, let's say they own an insurance agency, they own a State Farm agency. Well, State Farm sold them the rights to use their name because they were seeking purposely small business owners. Small business owners are people who want to create businesses, but don't have to innovate or create the actual model. They just want to purchase whatever the entrepreneur created so that they can service their neighborhood or their area, right? That's what cooks do. Cooks do not create the meal. They're just able to scale it and they're able to uh, provide it in a quick amount of time so that someone can eat their lunch and have a great meal. Does that make sense? Also, an entrepreneur creates ideas in the process. Um, that's harder than what you think. When you are starting from, um, from nothing, um, you have to, there's a lot of trial and error. When you have trial and error, um, you're trying to figure out what is the best way to create a particular business model. Once you've perfected it, once you realize, oh, on Mondays I can do accounting, Tuesdays and Thursdays I'm instructing, on Wednesdays, I'm asking, I am, I am asking people for money, right? Those type of things um, are crucial, right? When you are a small business owner, you necessarily don't have to create the process. You can just follow the rule book, rule book or the guidelines that the entrepreneur or that the owner created, right? And you can benefit from it. People who own Subway restaurants or Chick-fil-A franchises. They purchase or buy the rights to own that restaurant, but the company, the corporate headquarters, also gives them a guidebook, a rule book as to how you manage everything. They tell you when you need to cool or prepare your meat, and they'll tell you how to wash your equipment. They'll show you how to use your uh, purchase your POS, your point of sale. They'll tell you how to advertise. They'll tell you what colors to advertise. They'll tell you all these types of rules and regulations that the entrepreneur spent years trying to perfect. Um, but the small business owner can just follow the instructions and make money, right? When the entrepreneur does all of these things, they incur risk, right? They are able to they have to be able to, um, they incur risk. Some people, the market may like it, the market may not like it. If the market likes something, they take a note, they jot it down. So I'm going to make sure I do this from now on and add it to the instruction manual. If someone does not like what they've done, they scratch it out, right? It's a risk. For a small business owner, all they have to do is follow guidelines to be successful, right? Also, lastly, an entrepreneur develops the initial organ organizational structure, um, whereas the small business owner just follows an existing structure. The reason why I like this as an entrepreneur is that you have more flexibility. I don't know if I said this in the first class, but um, as an entrepreneur, you can hire whomever you like. 
because it's your business. Um, I've hired individuals who had um, whom whom I who I knew who I knew was uh, they may have they were family members who may have had a run in with the law, and they probably have a criminal record. Well, I know they have been re rehabilitated, but when they try to look for work, it's hard for them because they still have to check the box that they've been convicted of a crime. Well. If you're a small business owner or if you're an owner who just goes by applications, you have to follow certain rules and regulations. And if someone checks, they've been, a, um, um, they have been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor, that may affect their employment status. But if you own your own shop, you own your own business, it's, uh, it's easier to navigate around that. All right, any questions? No, okay. we're going to skip social entrepreneurship. I want to go to pros and cons, and then I want us, and then we'll talk about characteristics of entrepreneurs, and then we'll take a five-minute break, all right? No deal. The pros and cons of entrepreneurship. The pros, you are the master of your fate. You can do whatever you, you have. You can do whatever you like to make your business work. If you want to wake up at 10 a.m. and work until 2 a.m., you can do that. If you want to work, wake up at 5 a.m., work from 6 until 3, and then have the rest of the day to yourself, you can do that as well. You have that power. Also, as a pro, you can create jobs for you, your friends, and your family, and your community. We said, I said that earlier about the, the convict bill, right? Another pro is time flexibility to get involved with like other activities. One thing that I love about entrepreneurship is that I love to have the flexibility to um, become a leader in my community. I like to go to City Hall and make comments on improving my streets in my, in my neighborhood or having street lights available or being able to improve our educational system by creating, having volunteers at our local elementary school. I like those things. I have the flexibility to do those things because I own my own business. Someone who is employed by someone who has to punch in a clock either will have to take time off, which will cost you money, or you don't have the flexibility to do everything that you want to do. And so I really, truly enjoy having that, that type of flexibility. Lastly, on the pros is that you get to create your own culture. One thing that I also implement in all of my businesses is casual Friday. If you don't have a public meeting somewhere, I like uh, people to come in the office casual. Why? Because I like casual clothes. I like Jordans. I like to wear Jordans. I like Chuck Taylors. Um, sometimes I like, I want to stun on them. I want people to see, I want to be able to wear those on a Friday. And so I created literally in our code of conduct, uh, casual Friday so that we can all just be casual at work, right? I have that power when you, when you are able to own the business. Some cons to entrepreneurship. You have a higher risk profession. What does that mean? Well, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 20. I've been an entrepreneur since I was 13. But after college, I made a decision to stick with the entrepreneurship path and not take the corporate America path. And though I've become owners of businesses, I've done a lot of things in the local, state, and the national level. If I were to stop doing this and to try to apply for a job at at and or apply for a job at another large corporation, I will have to start close to square one again because I did not build enough experience within the corporation to where it translates into an executive position. I just been the master of everything on my little on my little realm, right? But I did not start as an entry level position. I did not get promoted to be a middle manager. I did not promote get promoted to go to another department. I did not go through any of these trainings and things that businesses typically do for their employees to enhance their skill sets to qualify them to go into upper management. I didn't go through that track. And that's a risk that I that I chose when I graduated from college. Another con is that entrepreneurship is highly volatile. Um, literally, ninety two percent of businesses will close its doors after five years. 
it's not a great place to be. Um, it's high risk um, and it takes a special type of person to be an entrepreneur. The burden is on the owner um, for the most part. So if something happened, you can't go to legal, you can't go to your boss or supervisor, the buck stops with you. Whether it is you have to um, pay, if, 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 let's say you own three or four trucks and one of the trucks broke down. Well, you can't just say, well, you know what, I'm just going to write in um, a, 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 a requisite, or, uh, I'm not gonna request, uh, have a requisition for a new truck. I had to take money out of my own pocket to pay for the repairs for that truck. That's what entrepreneurs have to do. And lastly, larger companies and entities can eventually become hostile competitors. When you have a small business and you're getting some success, you're starting to get some, some Facebook love, some Instagram love, um, some people are starting to um, identify what your business is. You can have larger businesses or world businesses become your competitors because you're now being a, getting um, on their radar. There was a business um, that's really large. It's an international business that is worth billions of dollars. They sued us because they think they thought that my our logo looked similar to theirs, right? They literally sued us for $100,000, right? We were pretty successful, but we weren't making enough money to, to settle in for $100,000. So what did we do? We as a small business had to change our logo. We spent about $10,000 to hire a marketing firm to help us change the logo. And that was all because one company sent us a letter threatening us to sue. Simple as that. So th those are um, pros and cons to being um, an entrepreneur. Now, what I'll do is I want to quickly go over the characteristics of entrepreneurs because we've talked about a lot of these already. I just want to give you an idea of, of some other characteristics. You have to be passionate and motivated. Um, that's really important. Why do you think that's important? Why is passion and motivation are important characteristics of entrepreneurs? Anyone can say that. Anyone can call it out. That's what drives you. That's what keeps you going. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when things get rough. So sometimes um, there are going to be peaks and there are going to be valleys in your entrepreneurship journey. When things are great, you can work all day. Like when, you, when you're making a lot of money in one time, um, it's very easy to go to work every day. But if the money is coming in, if the times are rough, if it's an off season, um, for your business, um, you're not as motivated uh, to work. So you have to have that intrinsic yourself motivation. Um, another characteristic is you can't be afraid to take risk. Um, you have to be smart with your risk, but you can't be afraid to take them. Um, that's very important. Um, Self-belief, hard work, and discipline, dedication is a factor. It's crucial um, in your characteristics of an entrepreneur. You need to be adaptable and flexible. Um, and you need to know your product and market. Um, you not only need to know your product, but you need to know what your competitors are doing. You have to have knowledge of all things around you. You have to have strong money management. We're going to talk about that more in depth next week um, when we're bringing, I'm bringing two financial professionals here to class. It's going to be really important for you to attend class next week um, because we have someone that's going to go over personal finances, and then someone's going to go over business finances. You need to have effective planning skills. Um, you need to have the right connection. Exit preparedness. You need to be able to know when you would like to exit your business. There are some businesses that want to just last throughout the livelihood of their, the, the owner. A lot of SMEs, a lot of small and medium enterprise businesses, are structured that way to where it stays in the family um, and the, the owner passes, passes the business on to their children or to a loved one so they keep the legacy going. But some businesses 
um, are purposed to only last five years before they sell it to someone else because their intention is to make a profit on what they built. So you have to understand and know that you have certain guidelines for exit preparedness. And then also you have to have the ability to question yourself, but not too much. One, the last thing that Mark Cuban said is that you have to realize, understand that entrepreneurs lie to themselves. Well, lying to themselves is not blatantly lying, but it's always challenging yourself to push the outer limits. Um, and, and another way of doing that is to question it. Question how good your product is. Can you make it a little bit better? But you don't want to question yourself too much because if you do that, if you question yourself too much, you will get stuck and you'll have paralysis by analysis. Does that make sense? Is, are there any questions? How are y'all feeling? What, type in the chat box um, how you felt for this first hour of class about general entrepreneurship. I feel like I'm learning a lot more compared to what I've learned in the book. Oh, Thank yeah. You for sharing your experiences. Yeah, I feel like, you know, you speaking about your um, your experience within your work, it, it really helps support what I'm learning in the lecture and in the book. OK, good. That's that's the purpose of me um, meeting you on Thursdays at four o'clock, because I know one, it's tough to just read a textbook, do an assignment. Um, you can understand that a little bit, but it's really important for you to hear from an entrepreneur, our perspective on things. And that's why I enjoy teaching. Um, I'm still an entrepreneur. I, I'm, I will work once we end class today. I have to go back to work. So I totally understand. And I appreciate you sharing that. All right. Well, what we'll do now is 5.03. Let, let's have a quick bio break and then what I'll well, we'll let's break until 508 um, and then we'll start talking about the midterm um, and then we'll go into our small groups all right All right, I'm glad we had a great break. Now for the second hour, I want us to talk a little bit about your midterm. And in, in essence, it'll be your final exam description as well. And then I want us to go into small groups. I'm going to break you out into, um, into breakout rooms, into three breakout rooms. So be prepared in the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, to interact with, with some of your, your classmates in a breakout room. We're going to discuss midterm. Please ignore this date. It's not March 4th. In fact, I believe your midterm is due next week, the week after next, right before Thanksgiving. I want to say November 16th, I believe. Um, use your textbook as a guide um, to writing the midterm and then eventually your final project. But the question is, what is your midterm? Your midterm is pretty much a basic business plan. I want you all to create um, a business plan that's gonna focus on four, um, four specific topics. Um, you and your group, which I will assign you all your groups at class today. In fact, as soon as we end class today, I'll make those assignments and send them to you. Um, but your four or five individuals who are in your group will create a business of your um, that you will want to create for um, to present, and then you will create a uh, create a business plan for it. All right. So there are going to be four things. Well, one, let me talk about what a business plan is. The true purpose of a business plan is a comprehensive fleshed out document describing your business. It's nothing magical. It's nothing that is aspirational. It's literally your dream and your vision on paper. That's what a business plan is. Some people's business plans, some people's successful business plans 
could be as short as a page or two pages long. I've worked with business plans that are 90 to 100 pages long. Either one of those, uh, depending on the content, could be a good business plan or a bad business plan. You can have a great two-page business plan. You can have a terrible 90-page business plan or vice versa, right? Business plans come in various forms. Um, they change based on industry. Um, some people who are in construction or who are in um, um, industry uh, warehousing um, may have a different business plan than someone who's an artist who wants to create an art gallery. They may have a different type of business plan where it's more portfolio, more examples of their artwork, things of that nature. Whereas um, an industrial part business plan can be more structured, more um, logistical, if you will, because there's so many other moving parts in business that's associated with it, right? Another version of business plans could also differ based on your personality. Even if you're in the same industry, I am more of an out extrovert, outgoing person. I'm also a former musician in my past life. So I will have a different twist of my business compared to a consultant who may have had uh, an athletic background or who may have been a CPA or an accountant or a lawyer by trade. We may have the same consulting business, but have different types of business plans. It just depends. So that's quite all right. I am not going to grade you on the style or your form of your business plan. What I will grade you on and what I'm looking for are these four main points. This is very important. This is very crucial. The first thing is what your what is your business, which I will also call your business narrative. I'll write that down here. Your business narrative. Your business narrative is what exactly you envision your business to be in narrative form, in paper form, in paragraph form. This is the portion of your business plan that you are also selling me as to why this is an important business. So let's just say I am an investor and you and your group want me to invest in your business and you give me your business plan. Well, your first page, your first couple of pages should be a description of what your business is and why you all started the business. It should be an emotional appeal to me, right? I want to be interested. Oh, this is pretty neat. Let me read more so I can figure out how financially feasible this is and see if they've done their homework. But from the first two pages, I am sold. This is a great business that I will want to learn more things about. That's what the narrative, the business narrative is. Number two is your financials, which is also how it'll make money. Some every business have has different have different financial models, um, depending on how much startup costs you need, um, can depend on how much money you would like to borrow. For group excellence for, for that business, we didn't borrow much money. We only received a $10,000 loan, right? And that was just enough so that we can um, hire several other people and create curriculum to go to schools, right? But I've created a business that I've had to request $400,000 because uh, initially, because we, need, we needed to buy property, we needed to buy equipment, we need to buy trucks. We need to buy an, or lease uh, other equipment for the actual business. So that was um, shown in my business plan. That was different from my group business business plan. I asked for different types of money, right? I cannot tell you how much money you should ask for um, at this point because I don't know what your business is, right? Your third component to, this, to the business plan is the competition. Your competition is very important because this, this shows, um, let me see if I can spell competition right. This is what happens when you don't 
when you're relying on computers and there's no red squiggles. But your comp when you your comp competition portion of your business plan shows investors and shows people in general that you've done your homework. The, you know how the market looks. You know that, you know what, even though you want to create a bar, there, there's either 10 bars in the same block or there are zero bars available, which I mean, it'll be a prime um, opportunity for you. But when you write, your, when you make a competitive analysis inside your business plan, investors look at that and say, oh, they're not only passionate about this business, but they actually know how to make this successful right which is very important and the fourth component or your operations your operations portion is very vital um, to your business because your operation is who actually is going to run your business um who what what's the roles of your team members um for for this class i don't want you for the operations portion of the paper i want you all to state each individual role per person of the group. So somebody may be a marketing person, someone may be an IT person, someone may be an HR, another person may be the store manager. It doesn't matter. I, there are no specific titles you have to have, but the roles and responsibilities uh, are vital um, for identifying roles and responsibilities um, is vital for a successful business plan. All right. Let's get this line. We'll start with how your financials. And we'll have another presentation next week about this, um, but I want to focus on what I will expect in the financial um, portion of your um, business plan. One, and like I said, we'll go over this again. You should know, one, every business, every banker, investor, will probably ask for your personal financial statements. I'm not gonna ask for your personal financial statements in class. I'm not trying to get all of your business like that. But I want to prepare you to know that um, your personal finances is an indicator for how successful you can manage your business. It's not a direct correlation, but a lot of people like to use your personal financial statements to see how responsible you'll be with other people's money. Because when you're starting a business, you're typically going to ask to borrow money from one way or a fashion, whether it's through family members or through entities um, and, and large bodies, right? Secondly, in your financial statements, you need to find, you need to identify your profit loss projection. You need to know at what, at what point will you start making money? Uh, what will happen when you lose money? Some people, if you have, let's say, a landscaping business, the down, when's the, when are typical downtimes of a landscaping business? Someone who cuts yards or trims trees and things of that nature. Does anyone know? Winter. Winter, right? So my first job, my first business when I was 13, I had a landscaping business. And my peak times were spring and summer. Because one, grass is growing. Two, there's water, right? Um, as, as the temperature gets cooler, as grass becomes dormant um, during the winter, doesn't grow as fast, and uh, you won't have opportunities to make as much money. If you're writing a business plan and you have a landscaping company, writing that in shows, that, shows to the investors that you are projecting or you're predicting when you'll have less profits than your peak times, which also is a sign of intelligence. So that's really important. And a projected cash flow. It's a, a projected cash flow is really important. And keep in mind, cash flow is different than profit, which is different from cost. So cash flow is literally the amount of money you get, you make day in, you receive day in and day out to keep your business going. So cash flow could be profits, but cash flow could also be money borrowed from other people, 
right? It's just the amount of money it takes for you, for your business to operate each day. And then lastly is the break-even analysis. At what point in your sale, how many sales uh, will it take for you to break even? When I say break even, it means you have made enough money to pay all of your debtors, but you have not made profit to, to pocket yourself. You literally have created a space where you can, for whatever things that's owed to you, as owed from you, you can pay back. Whether it's employees, um, whether it is purchasing equipment, um, you need to know how many how many units did you need to sell in order to cover all of those costs? And again, we'll talk about that more next week. Secondly, the competition. Competition states who directly or indirectly competes with you. Does anyone know the difference between an indirect and a direct competitor? Have y'all have heard? Have y'all heard those terms? Well, I'll go ahead and I'll explain a little bit more. A direct competitor is someone who is in your same industry, the same geographic location, who's providing very similar service. So Chick-fil-A and Raising Cane's are direct competitors. Why? Because they are both fast food restaurants. They both focus on chicken and the price points are very similar, right? However, an indirect competitor to Chick-fil-A may be Chili's restaurant. An indirect competitor is, uh, com is someone who has similar um, classifications of things that they're doing to create their business. So the Chick-fil-A and Chili's both serve food. So that's the similarity. But the difference is the price point. Um, some of the price points of chili is maybe a little bit higher. Um, it's also a different style of restaurant. Chick-fil-A is primarily fast food and quick eating inside um, whenever we're sitting inside. But Chili's is more of a casual dining that sit down, that's, that's, that's not, that doesn't have a drive through window. So they are indirect competitors um, because they could, they have some similarities but they're not competing on every facet of their business. Can someone give me another example outside of food of a direct and indirect competitors? Or give me a, get a shoot a stab at it. Would Dick? Sporting Goods and Academy be direct? Yes, Big Sporting Goods and Academy Sports and Outdoors are direct competitors because they both focus on sporting and outdoors um, activities. It's great. What would be a, in that area, in that realm, what would be, a, 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 what would be, what would be an indirect competitor to Dick Sporting Goods? Does anyone know? I would assume another sort of retail environment, maybe like, um, I don't know. It doesn't matter if it's the same kind of market. Because um, my example would be something like maybe Dillard's or Macy's that would feature some sort of like outdoor apparel, but it's not necessarily exactly. uh, a store exactly for mm -hmm. outdoorsy people. Yeah, absolutely right. That's a great example. Um, a department store that has a variety of um, brands or a variety of uh, types of clothing, like a Dillard's, Nordstrom's, J.C. Penney, um, J.C. Penney, based on where you're staying, Kohl's, Marshalls. Those are indirect competitors because they're not they though that they off though they offer outdoors apparel. Um, that's not their primary. Um, source of their business model. They have other facets um, that they're also selling. So that's a great example. Good job, Angie, on, on stating an indirect competitor on that deal. Good, right. Nike. Nike and what else? That's good. And, and Dick's 
sporting goods as well, right? Good. That so the, the, actual, the actual Nike store, correct? Uh huh. Yes. So Nike okay. store is an indirect competitor to Dick's sporting goods because Nike is exclusive to selling Nike apparel, Nike products alone. Whereas Dick's sporting goods will have Nike, but they will also possibly have other brands as well. Great examples. All right. I also want us to talk about a competitive analysis, which you'll see on this slide. So when you are doing your research, um, this, this um, actual chart or table will be important. I'm pointing on my left screen because that's where my chart is here um, with my camera right in front. But um, this chart is really important in terms of identifying um, your strengths and the weaknesses of not only your competitors, but also your um, fact, your product as well. Um, so please be, be able to use this um, or something similar to this in your research for your midterm. I don't want to see this graph in your paper, but I want you to, I want to see an explanation of this chart um, in your in your presentation, in your midterm, in your and in your um, final exam. And lastly, I want us to talk about operations. Operations covers a lot of things. It covers personnel. It covers production. It covers your location. It even covers your professional and your advisory support. Those people are like your mentors, experts in the field that you're in, um, that you're seeking out. I know that um, one, of, one of your homework assignments is to interview, well, several of your assignments will be to interview entrepreneurs. That's purposefully so that you can seek out experts in a particular field, right? Those are important for um, your advisory and your professional board, right? board of directors, your attorney, your CPA, and your insurance agent. All of these things are important in terms of identifying um, the best way to operate your business. And in your operations portion of your midterm, I want you to be able to identify potential mentors, potential experts, attorney, you don't need to worry about board of directors. But for your operations, like I said earlier, identify each role for each group member and try to fin figure out either physical location or virtual location for your business. All right, are there any questions? I will also make this slide of this video presentation will be available on Canvas probably this evening or late or first thing tomorrow morning. All right, now we're going to go into a group activity. All right, I'm going to break us out into breakout rooms as soon as I can figure out how to do that here. Now, breakout rooms, three rooms, I'm gonna sign automatically, create. All right, we got you. All right, perfect. So now that's ready to go. So in this group activity, we're going to get in the groups of, looks like we're going to get in the groups of five, four or five, instead of three or four. Um, before y'all get started, I want you all to assign someone um, to take notes. And then I want you to assign someone to report out um, after we finish, uh, after y'all finish with your groups. And with that, I want you all to create a business using the following format. And these are four things. One, what service does the business provide? That sounds like your narrative, like we discussed earlier. Secondly, how will your business make money? Your financials. Thirdly, how will the business operate? Operation. And your fourth thing, who are your competitors? Competition, right? So I want you to do, I want you to be able to um, go into your breakout rooms and I will, I will, go into each breakout room to see if y'all have any questions, all right? I'll also try to make this slide available for you. If you all can, please make a snapshot of this, of this slide in particular um, this, uh, with these instructions. I am opening the rooms now. All 
right. Uh, when you men when you say reporting I all right so you all are back from your breakout rooms and you all have had about 12 to 13 minutes to discuss a potential business venture what breakout room one uh, with the the representative from breakout room one uh, the one with I guess five people um, would you all uh, give us your report of your business Which breakout room was that? The one with five people. Um, I believe our group had, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that we were numbered, um, but I do think that my group had five people. Okay. Um, so, so for our project, or well, for our business format, we decided that it would be um, really, really marketable to provide a construction management service. The way that we would make money is by targeting ourselves more to residential properties. We'd like to be able to charge per square footage of the land that we're building on and make ourselves, um, make ourselves profitable from from again the square footage that we charge the material that we would be needing and then also employing subcontractors and the way that the subcontractors would function is that they would be the ones actually performing the work and building on the land um, the purpose of our business is just to handle the management um, the way that our business would operate is by employing the different the different positions that would be needed when managing such a project, especially for, I mean, you know, potentially large clients that mm -hmm. would include like building bigger homes. And of course that would be a lot of funding and money that we would need to be handling um, from our clients. So therefore I, I feel that we would need project managers. We need financial analysts. We need a marketing team and management to, uh, um, I guess, lower level management to handle more of the on-site um, operations. Okay. Our competitors, there would be a vast number of competitors, but for the most part, we feel that larger names would be our biggest competition, such as DR Horton and companies who hold multiple project managers. Good, great job. Um, thank you all for, for being able to do that in such short time. Um, I think another group had something that was similar in the construction agency, correct? Who, if that uh, second group would uh, go ahead and their representative speak a little bit on their business model. I want to say it was someone in construction. I could be off. If not, one of the other two groups can go ahead and present. Oh, we'll go ahead and go. Okay. Uh, we were a group of four with Kavion, um, Carlos, and there's somebody else. I'm sorry, I forgot the other person. Okay. Oh, and Mark. Mark. 
Um, so our business is we would provide um, something maybe similar like Postmates and Uber Eats. Uh, we would provide food and everyday items to customers. Um, we would partner with local restaurants and retail retail stores. Um, we would create an app where they would have food and everyday items available for purchase, and customers will be avail will be able to give special requests to to us employees. Um, for instance, if they wanted their their fruits and vegetables to be pack packaged and bagged together, then they could request that. If they wanted the meats to be packed together, they could request that. Um, most of our competitors would be Grubhub, Postmates, and Instacart, along with Uber Eats. Good. Thanks, Anya, for, uh, for stating that. I appreciate you having a food service type company. Anyone else? The last group, certainly not least. Uh, the last group would be my group with Ramses, Enrique, and of course myself, Dominique. We called our company Red Cleaning, which it would be like a stage house cleaning. We'd come that's in before. That's what it is. We'd come in before a realtor stage a home and we'd clean up any extra materials that might have been left behind or just get everything prepped and ready. Uh, how the business would make money would be what char we charge realtors a fee per hour, also factoring in square footage of the homes. So, for instance, on a small scale, this isn't realistic numbers. Twenty, like a small home, would be twenty dollars per hour. Medium homes, forty, and and so on and so forth. Gotcha. And our business would operate by creating small cleaning crews of about three to four people to, uh, with an aim to clean at least four to five houses a day. Our competitors would probably include people such as Modern Maid, Dallas Maids, and our incorrect, uh, incorrect our indirect competitor would be things like Stanley Steamer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, all three groups. Thank you for, for your contribution. Thank you for you all working together. Um, and thank you for creating three viable business options, whether it's Uber Eat model, whether it is construction management, or um, it is a cleaning services. This niche market is new builds or new um, or new um, investment homes and facilities. Thought those are all really great ideas, and that's how I want your format for your midterm to be. It's not hard. It's not super hard. We want to go a little further into this next week, but. I want to show you, that's the model that is in your syllabus on what the midterm in your, in your final exam. So after class today, I will assign you all groups and then I will message you all, you all's groups names, uh, group numbers um, so that you all can meet. Um, but you, in essence, you all will be providing the, this type of information. For your midterm, you want, it's gonna be a four page paper where you'll have one page for each one of the topics. And then your final exam will be eight pages, which each topic will be about two pages each. All right. Does anyone have any questions uh, on that, on the formatting or what I'm expecting for your midterm? Not at the moment, but if we think of something, can we email you? Oh, definitely. And like I said, next week we're going, I'm going to explain again in depth at the beginning of our class my expectations for the midterm. I just wanted you all to get oriented today so that you can know, have a feel. Um, and when I assign your groups, you can hopefully spread, um, the, spread the message to the remaining members of your class on expectations for your midterm. So are you expecting one paper, four pages from each of us? One okay. paper per group. Per group. Okay. Per group. So each group assignment will have four page paper that's going to submit to. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Are there any questions? Did that answer? I know, Pete, did that answer a lot of people's questions? I know people are like, we're three weeks in. I don't know how to turn in this midterm. I want you all to be able to turn a quality project in. I want to say, if not next Friday to Friday after next, I don't have it in front of me. I can put it in front of me. Let me see when the midterm is due. Uh, the midterm is actually due next Friday. Next Friday? Yeah. yeah. So we'll, I give, we'll have one more lesson 
until on next Thursday. That'll be a recap of what I'm expecting. Um, but um, you should have enough information um, to to be able to have a good um, midterm next Friday. All right. Are there any other questions? Um, about that assignment, I think it's called testing the hypothesis. Yes. Um, I know it was mentioned the first week, but um, I think it asked for like five people to be interviewed. And I think you said something about we can interview two or three. Two to three. Is that something? Mm -hmm. Two to three. Yes, okay. I just want to know mm -hmm. about that. Any other questions? If not, please feel free to send me a message. Um, like I said, I'll hopefully I'll catch up with the rest of my messages by the end of this week. Um, and we should be in good shape. Thank you all very much, and y'all have a great, great day. Have a good night. You can disregard right, you my email that I sent you. You answered my questions today. Okay, perfect. I'm glad I was able to do that. I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, the buyer behavior assignment. Um, I was kind of going over it today. Do you mind just um, like expectation wise, like what you're wanting out of that? The buyer behavior number one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, most people, when they see the pick, set, pick a segment, um, I just want you to, let's see. So it says, so I'm reading it right now. So I know it says in class, we've discussed how you might, uh, into the existence of the, uh, for the assignment, just pick a segment that you would like to research. So let's just say if you want to do uh, automotive or hair, beauty, or restaurant, pick that segment, find three people um, to interview them, and then begin the need awareness. And it's just make an analysis based on those interviews. It looks like. And it says the interview should be 10 to 15 minutes, but if you make them four to five minutes, that'll be fine too. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? 